Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I trust you, your family and your loved ones are safe in these extraordinary times and what an extraordinary year it has been so far. And one can only imagine the more twists and turns to come. I wrote an article over the weekend, COVID-19 and the spillover moment, and that was my podcast from yesterday. Uh, that's on YouTube if you care to have a listen. Macro thoughts, Deutsche Bank's gauge of high frequency US economic data is now 23 standard deviations worse than normal. On course for a 15% year on year fall in GDP. And I think that's about right. That's from Tracy Alloway. As I said on the 6th of April, I also know that we're about to enter the Great Depression. You can't just switch this economy on. It's a lot to do with behavioral economics. And um, I think people are going to be very circumspect about uh, returning to what existed before. What's certain is that the whole global economy has been hit by an insidious, literally invisible circuit breaker. Citibank executive stocks appear to be pricing in an economic bungee cord snap back. Um, they do, but that's all about, uh, and I touched on this yesterday, it's about the golden flood of liquidity that the Fed has unleashed um, and you can't fight that liquidity and that's why equity markets have risen. Home Thoughts, Seoul Mayor says 85 new coronavirus cases now linked to Itaewon Club case. Next two or three days will be a critical time. If Seoul falls, the country falls. Park won soon via P. Hancock, CNN. This is a photograph from South Korea via RFI, Foyer de Contamination du Coronavirus à Seoul. Um, it's kind of apocalyptic, these scenes and photographs. NHK conducted an experiment to see how germs spread at a cruise buffet. They applied fluorescent paint to the hands of one person and then had a group of 10 people dine. And look what happened, it's a video. In 30 minutes, the paint transferred to every individual and was on the faces of three. I like this from Rob G. McFarlane, Tablet 11, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is in the British Museum. You gods, may I be mindful of these days and never forget them. And there is indeed something karmic in this COVID-19. The New Yorker a few months ago had a super article about how to read Gilgamesh. And I'll just uh, extract a poem. A carnelian tree was in fruit, hung with bunches of grapes, lovely to look on. A lapis lazuli tree bore foliage in full fruit and gorgeous to gaze on. To me, this is the most dazzling passage in the poem, the engulfing darkness in which Gilgamesh can see nothing for hours. He is just an organism in a hole. And then suddenly light, color, beautiful globes of purple and red hanging from the trees God's world made for us, or so we thought. Gilgamesh does not linger in the garden. He at last finds Uta Napishti, the man who gazed on death and survived. Gilgamesh wants to know, how did you do this? Unhelpfully, Uta Napishti explains, no one at all sees death. No one at all sees the face of death. No one at all hears the voice of death. Death so savage who hacks men down. 
ever the river has risen and brought us the flood, the mayfly floating on the water, on the face of the sun its countenance gazes, then all of a sudden nothing is there. And that took me back to my article, The Way We Live Now. You felt the land taking you back to what was there a hundred years ago, to what had been there always. And of course, Don DeLillo, who wrote, Everything is barely weeks, everything is days, we have minutes to live. There is a super article in The Atlantic talking about traveling uh, uh, in the now and uh, dystopian public service announcements echoed through the airport. A little detail that because these planes are not full, the speed of takeoff is very accelerated. I like this Hey New York chart shows how train turnstile entries for Manhattan pre-pandemic was 3 million per day. That's obviously dropped off substantially. That's from David Inglis. And that's why I said over the weekend, we're in the realm of behavioral economics now. This one's for you, New York dreams. This is from Saturday Night Live at home. Um, well, rather beautiful, actually. Carnival announces a four-day cruise from Miami for just $119. You may contract a potentially lethal disease and have to quarantine for weeks after, tweeted Mims. There's an outstanding article I came across, Irene Bromage, The Risks, Know Them, Avoid Them. It seems many people are breathing some relief, and I'm not sure why. An epidemic curve has a relatively predictable upslope, and once the peak is reached, the backslope can also be predicted. As states reopen and we give the virus more fuel, all bets are off. I understand the reasons for reopening the economy, but I've said before, if you don't solve the biology, the economy won't recover. And that's a point I've also been making. As a simple example of the USA trend, when you take out the data from New York and just look at the rest of the United States, daily case numbers are increasing. Bottom line, the only reason the total USA new case numbers look flat right now is because the New York City epidemic was so large and now it is being contained. We know most people get infected in their own home. A household member contracts the virus in the community and brings it into the house where sustained contact between household members leads to infection. In order to get infected, you need to get exposed to an infectious dose of the virus based on infectious dose studies with MERS and SARS. It is estimated that as few as 1,000 SARS-CoV-2 viral particles are needed for an infection to take hold. Remember that, a thousand. Please note this will still needs to be determined experimentally, but we can use that number to demonstrate how infection can occur. Infection could occur through 1,000 viral particles you receive in one breath or from one eye rub, or 100 viral particles inhaled with each breath over 10 breaths, or 10 viral particles with a hundred breaths. A bathroom. Bathrooms have a lot of high-touch surfaces, door handles, faucets, stall doors, so fomite transfer risk in this environment can be high. We still do not know whether a person releases infectious material in feces or just fragmented virus, but we do know that toilet flushing does aerosolize many droplets. A cough, a single cough releases about 3,000 droplets 
Droplets travel at 50 miles per hour. Most droplets are large and fall quickly, but many do stay in the air and can travel across a room in a few seconds. A sneeze, a single sneeze, releases about 30,000 droplets, with droplets travelling at up to 200 miles per hour. Most droplets are small and travel great distances, easily across a room. If a person is infected, the droplets in a single cough or sneeze may contain as many as 200 million virus particles, which can all be dispersed into the environment around them. A breath. A single breath releases 50 to 5,000 droplets. Most of these droplets are low velocity and fall to the ground quickly. There are even fewer droplets released through nose breathing. Importantly, due to the lack of exhalation force with the breath, viral particles from the lower respiratory areas are not expelled. Unlike sneezing and coughing, which releases huge amounts of viral material, the respiratory droplets released from breathing only contain low levels of virus. If a person coughs or sneezes, those 200 million viral particles go everywhere. So if you're face to face with a person having a conversation and that person sneezes or coughs straight at you, it's pretty easy to see how it is possible to inhale 1,000 virus particles and become infected. All you have to do is enter that room within a few minutes of the cough, sneeze and take a few breaths and you have potentially received enough virus to establish an infection. But with general breathing, 20 copies per minute into the environment, even if every virus ended up in your lungs, you would need 1,000 copies divided by 20 copies per minute equals 50 minutes. Symptomatic people are not the only way the virus is shed. We know that at least 44% of all infections and the majority of community-acquired transmissions occur from people without any symptoms, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people. So just prior to symptoms showing, you're releasing the most virus into the environment. Interestingly, the data shows that just 20% of infected people are responsible for 99% of viral load that could potentially be released into the environment. When you think of outbreak clusters, what are the big ones that come to mind? Most people would go to the cruise ships, but you would be wrong. Ship outbreaks don't even land in the top 50 outbreaks to date. Ignoring the terrible outbreaks in nursing homes, we find that the biggest outbreaks are in prisons, religious ceremonies, workplaces, meat packing facilities and call centres, any environment that is enclosed with poor air circulation and high density of people spells trouble. Meat packing. In meat processing plants, densely packed workers must communicate to one another amidst the deafening drum of industrial machinery and a cold room virus preserving environment, there are now outbreaks in 115 facilities across 23 states. More than 5,000 workers are infected with 20 dead. Weddings, funerals, birthdays, 10% of early spreading events. Business networking, face-to-face -face business networking like the Biogen conference in Boston in March. Restaurants, some really great shoe leather epidemiology demonstrated clearly the effect of a single asymptomatic, asymptomatic carry in a restaurant environment. The infected person A sat at a table, had dinner with nine friends. Dinner took about one to one and a half hours. During the meal, the asymptomatic carrier released low levels of virus into the air, airflow was from right to left, approximately 50% of the people at the infected person's table became sick over the next seven days. 75% of the people on the adjacent downwind table became inf infected. And even two of the seven on the upwind table were infected. Workplaces, another great example is the outbreak in a call centre. Single infected employee came to work on the 11th floor of a building the floor had 216 employees. Over the period of the week, 94 of those people became infected. 92 of those 94 people became sick. 
choir, church choir in Washington State, even though people were aware of the virus, took steps to minimize transfer. They avoided the usual handshakes and hugs hello. People also brought their own music to avoid sharing and socially distanced themselves during practice. A single asymptomatic carrier infected most of the people in attendance. The choir sang for two and a half hours inside an enclosed church, which was roughly the size of a volleyball court. Singing to a greater degree than talking aerosolizes respiratory droplets extraordinarily well. Over a period of four days, 45 of the 60 choir members developed symptoms, two died. Uh, members of the church became sick. Um, this is another example of a, a fellow called Bob. Um, have a read about that. Importantly, of the countries performing contact tracing properly, only a single outbreak has been reported from an outdoor environment. Less than 0.3% of traced infections. Um, <clears throat> even if they were 50 feet away, choir or call centre, even a low dose of the virus in the air reaching them over a sustained period was enough to cause infection and in some cases death. The effects of sunlight, heat and humidity on viral survival all serve to minimise the risk to everyone when outside. Talking about shopping, low density, high air volume of the store, along with the restricted time you spend in the store, means that the opportunity to receive an infectious dose is low. But for the store worker, the extended time they spend in the store provides a greater opportunity to receive the infectious dose, and therefore the job becomes more risky. <clears throat> Fascinating article, well worth reading. As I said, the virus is not correlated to endogenous market dynamics, but is an exogenous uncertainty that remains unresolved. And in a previous article in The Intelligencer, the saliva of a COVID-19 patient can harbor half a trillion virus particles per teaspoon, and a cough aerosolizes it into a diffuse mist. Therefore, the viral moment has arrived. Wuhan has ordered officials to test its entire population of 11 million people. Six locally transmitted cases were reported on May 10 and May 11, uh, were found in people already under quarantine. Even as Trump is urging Americans to become warriors without armor, the illusion of a virus-free world Trump has created for his own reality TV presentations is disintegrating. Putin just announced an end to Russia's nationwide lockdown from tomorrow, i.e. today, which is quite extraordinary because there's been an enormous surge. We're seeing more than 10% growth in numbers in Kuwait, Cameroon, Sudan, <clears throat> El Salvador. Russia's at more than 5% with India, Mexico, Pakistan, Chile, <clears throat> Qatar, Bangladesh, Colombia, South Africa, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Oman, Bolivia, Kyrgyzstan, DRC and Guatemala. And um, that's what I mean about the spillover. We're seeing it move out of the developed world, ex the US. Um, as I said previously, we wish we all had an Angela Merkel because at least then we might have a fighting chance. Matt Lucas sums up Boris Johnson's speech in 20 seconds. It's really very funny if it wasn't so sad. Leaders are saying, don't panic, and I want to say, look, chum, you're not Merkel, and just a few days ago you were telling me it's all cool, just the flu. Otherwise, others might take you seriously on what basis, I know not, but I don't. Only two European countries added more than a thousand cases on May 10. Emerging markets have replaced Europe as hotspots. That from Remy and confirms what I was writing about over the weekend, which was COVID-19 in the spillover moment. I quoted Camus, they fancied themselves free, wrote Camus, and no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. Um, I said the European trend is down. We're witnessing a spillover into emerging markets and frontier geographies. Brazil, the new global epicenter of the coronavirus. I said in Brazil we have a toxic mix of a voodoo president, Bolsonaro, and a runaway COVID-19 
You remember he said Brazilians aren't infected by anything, even when they fall into a sewer. It's tragic surrealism. I can't stop thinking about Gabriel Garcia Marquez when I think about the situation Manaus is facing. Um, as I said, viruses are in essence non-linear and multiplicative, and COVID-19 has escape velocity in Brazil. I said Brazil is a real-time laboratory experiment, and the, Amer and the African Jair Bolsonaro is, of course, John Pombe Magafuli of Tanzania, and I'll come to those numbers uh, momentarily. Um, the WHO believes that transmissions will likely be slower in Africa because of Africa's age pyramid and social environmental factors. Um, but what we are seeing now is transmission hotspots in Kano in Nigeria, Western Cape, Senegal, and of course Dar es Salaam. And then I was touching on the stock markets, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Paul Tudor Jones has become very bullish. I was talking about gold, about which I'm very bullish, um, crude oil, which I think that rebound will run out of uh, speed. I was touching on Africa and saying that Africa will go juche. Juche, of course, is the North Korean economic strategy and ideology. Um, so, as the coronavirus retreats across much of Europe, it is the turn of emerging and frontier markets. That's reiterated by Charlie Robertson. Numbers rising despite lockdowns in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Ghana has dropped the lockdown, but cases have jumped fourfold since then. Peru now has more active coronavirus cases than Spain per capita. Ecuador is above Italy, Belarus above Sweden. Hey, New York, that was the chart that um, David Inglis provided. Um, and as I've said previously, viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. In the currency markets, the euro is at 108.15. The dollar index is back above 100 at 100.162. The real is getting closer to that record low about which I wrote. I like this tweet from Russian market for the record. I'm neither long nor short on Bitcoin, but I do love the crypto chaos. As I said, some folks dived into Bitcoin, which top 10,000 were currently at 8,680. Paul Tudor Jones, the best profit maximizing strategy is to own the fastest horse, he said in an article, The Great Monetary Inflation. If I'm forced to forecast, my bet is it will be Bitcoin. Nuriel Rubini, said Bitcoin crashes by 15% in seven minutes on no news, a rigged, totally manipulated, Wales-controlled market where most transactions, 90% volumes are false, as exchanges pretend to have liquidity they don't have, massive pump and dump, spoofing, front-running, wash trading, total scam. I think he's right in point of fact, but then, you know, it could go much higher anyway, but the point is, what he's saying is correct. Um, and then I like this from Tracy Alloway. Bitcoin goes up. Institutional interest is growing. Blockchain is the future. It's the only market purely driven by demand, supply and demand dynamics. Bitcoin goes down. We're hazing the newcomers. It's the CME futures. It was over leveraged longs. This validates HODL. Mars was in retrograde. Commodity markets, Paul Tudor Jones, God, gold is going substantially higher, store of value for 2,500 years, taking out the peaks of the 1970s and 1980s. Production growth of bullion is 1% annually, while the Fed is creating money supply at a 30% pace, taking out the peaks of the 70s and 80s. As I said on the 24th of February, the viral moment has arrived. They were very becalmed of late. And I said then that gold will, is correlated to the virus and will turn parabolic, with the virus being non-linear and exponential already. 
And then on the 22nd of March, I said it will soon turn viral to the upside. I'm looking for $2,000 plus. And it feels as if we are, you know, girding our loins. Currently trading at $16.99. Crude oil, let's have a look at that, $25.33. Is Pakistan about to sign over the Gwadar port to China? Sources say yes. That's from Adam Scrabble. And that refers to the Hamban Tota moment, which might well have arrived for Imran Khan. Africa, African finance ministers launch debt talks with creditors, started talks with private creditors to find a way to temporarily suspend debt payments without triggering defaults. At least a dozen African finance ministers spoke during the hour and a half virtual meeting with more than 100 creditors on Monday according to a representative of private creditors who attended the gathering. Both sides talked about mechanisms that would allow nations to suspend payments while guaranteeing their access to debt markets in the future, said the representative. Not going to happen. If it gets suspended, they'll never access those markets for the foreseeable future, which is where we're headed. While official creditors have agreed to halt payments this year on about $20 billion of obligations, getting private investors to join the initiative is proving more difficult to, due to legal and financial complexities. A one-size-fits-all solution may not apply in light of the country's specific characteristics, they said in a joint statement. As I said, Africa will go juche. Juche is self-reliance and is the official ideology of North Korea. Basically, we've, Africa has over-borrowed, misspent, wasted it. And uh, you've got the same folks going back and saying, give us some more. Museveni says on uh, election 2021, in light of COVID, I don't think it would be wise. COVID-19 update in Africa, as of yesterday evening, 6 p.m., 64,214 cases, 2,293 deaths, and 22,243 recoveries, Africa CDC. Interesting, because it's, there's very little testing going on, is the positive test ratio. I got that from our world in data. Have a look at that. Um, I've written uh, on the 2nd of March, I said, we know that the coronavirus is exponential, non-linear, and multiplicative. And we know that exponential disease propagation looks like in the real world, nothing, 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 then cluster, 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 then boom. South Africa reports 14,731 new tests and 637 new confirmed cases yesterday. That's from Jeffrey York. That's a daily positivity rate of 4.3%. That's ticking up. A well-placed source in Dar es Salaam claims they have 16,467 cases tested positive, 1,293 dead. 40 people are dying of COVID-19 daily. That's from Andrew Mwenda, who's actually based in Rwanda. Um, but uh, the anecdotal evidence I've got is that's probably correct. Uh, well, I got better than anecdotal evidence. That is correct. As I said, the African Jair Bolsonaro is, of course, John Pombe Magafuli. And I was talking about the worrying development is transition hotspots. The question for sub-Saharan Africa is whether these transmission hotspots expand and conflate I asked, Kano in Nigeria, Western Cape is growing at an alarming rate. I also mentioned Tanzania as well. Um, it's almost impossible to secure a hospital bed in several cities. President in Ghana says one person infected 533 people with coronavirus at a Ghana fish factory. And this is the multiplicative nature of the disease. Senegal's holy city of Touba is fighting a second wave of COVID-19 infections. 
confirmed cases in Tube have risen sevenfold to more than 190 since a market trader fell ill in April, ending a two week lull in new cases. A Senegalese man returning from Italy had infected 17 others, including his two year old child, just weeks before Senegal's second city was due to host thousands of pilgrims at a religious festival. Touba is the headquarters of a powerful Sufi Muslim brotherhood known to some as Little Mecca. The Grand Mosque, whose white minarets tower over the city of 1.5 million people, was ordered to close its doors. Despite these efforts, the city confirmed its 27th case on April 11, the first since March 26. The man had not travelled abroad or come into contact with other known patients, a worrying development suggesting the disease had taken root. What can be done apart from pray for this disease to leave the planet, he said, as he packed up the plastic cups he had been selling to go home. Madagascar's COVID-19 miracle cure, the Mail and Guardian, takes a sceptical look at this. Ten African heads of state met via video chat. The meeting was presided over by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa in his capacity as chair of the African Union. Rajo Lina, the 45-year-old president of Madagascar, was the youngest person in attendance. He came bearing what he said was good news. Madagascar had discovered a cure for COVID-19. Rajo Lina says the bitter drink can both prevent and cure COVID-19 and has distributed it to school children across Madagascar. Rajalina, a former DJ who first came to power in a military coup in 2009, has released no evidence to support his claims. The other presidents did not push back, even though most had deep reservations. You know how it works at the African Union. Once people say such a thing, his peers are supposed to compliment him. And then referencing uh, the Malagasy Institute of Applied Research, um, amongst its successes was Madiglucil, an anti-diabetic drug derived from the Eugenia Jambolana plant, widely used in Madagascar and abroad. COVID Organics is its latest formulation. The primary ingredient is Artemisia, indigenous to China, important to, imported to Madagascar in the 1970s and now widely grown on the island. Like chloroquine, also controversially touted by head of state Trump as a COVID-19 treatment, the plant's active compound, artemisinin, is a recognized anti-malarial treatment. At a glitzy launch in April, he said, all trials and, tested have been, and tests have been conducted and its effectiveness in reducing and elimination of symptoms has been proven in the treatment of COVID-19 patients in Madagascar. But this cannot possibly be true, said Shabir Mahdi, professor of vaccinology at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Mahdi is also a founder and director of the African Leadership Initiative for Vaccinology Expertise. There is absolutely no evidence that it has cured anything, he told the Mail and Guardian. Mahdi noted that Madagascar only has a small number of confirmed cases, 158 as of 7th May, that's definitely not enough for a trial. Citing these sorts of numbers is a meaningless exercise. At one point, referencing HIV, AIDS and Tabo Mbeki, Cabinet Minister Manto Shabalala Msimang suggested beetroot and garlic were more effective treatments than antiretrovirals, despite all the evidence to the contrary. We would caution and advise against countries adopting a product that has not been taken through tests to see its efficacy against COVID-19 and its safety in different population groups. That's uh, Dr. Moetti, the WHO's Africa Region Director. Kenka Gassong, Director of Africa CDC, told the Mail and Garden, I heard the briefing the President of Madagascar made. We look forward to seeing the data and the design of the study. Last week, Madagascar dispatched 1.5 tons of the herbal drink to Equatorial Guinea. Another shipment went to Guinea-Bissau. President George Weah personally greeted a plane as it delivered samples for Liberia. And Tanzanian President John Magafuli, who has claimed three days of prayer can cure COVID-19, said he would send a plane to Antanarivo to collect a consignment. 
As I said, we all wish we had an Angela Merkel because at least then we might have a fighting chance. The COVID-19, in my view, is invisible, but it has already defeated the most expensive aircraft carriers, lurks everywhere in silence and has closed Mecca, St. Peter's Square, the Vatican, Com, and everywhere else we care to congregate and ask for succor. It is not to be trifled with. And I think the control machine has a novice in charge of the console. South African all share minus 12.07%. Dollar Rand softening now, 18.4325. IMF Executive Board approved $2.772 billion in emergency support to Egypt. Egyptian currency firm at 15.75. EGX30 minus 26.25% year to date. Nigerian Naira currently trades at 445 per dollar on the streets of Lagos, compared with the official rate of 386. 12-month Naira forwards were trading at about 514 on Monday. 5th of March and before, I said Nigeria's oil revenues cratering, a currency devaluation is now predicted and predictable. 9th of December last year, I was reiterating the same thing, saying time to big up the dosage of quaaludes. I, I said, everyone knows how this story ends. When the music stops, everyone will dash for the exit and the currency will collapse, just like it's collapsing in Lusaka. And essentially, we've moved from a world of hyper-connectedness to a world of quarantine. The drop in worldwide oil consumption in April alone has been put as as high as 35 million barrels per day. And that's why I said we're now entering the twilight zone for a lot of oil producers. Um, and I think increasingly we're seeing regime implosion risk ticking higher. Nigerian all share minus 10.77% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange minus 9.46% year to date. According to a forecast from FAO, the desert locust situation remains extremely serious in the Horn of Africa, where a new generation of swarms are starting to lay eggs. That's from Parveen Kaswan. Um, and this coincides with the current planting season. As I said, debt, virus and locusts are creating a perfect storm for Africa. Here in Kenya, you wouldn't think we have any issues. We've got a political scenario. Uh, Daily Nation is leading with how Uhuru cooked Ruto's goose. 2013, 2030s is going to be a transformational decade. From 2030, the fertility rate drops below three. Domestic savings rise significantly and investment goes up as it gets cheaper. This is Charlie Robertson's demographic theory. Kenya shilling at 106.20. Nairobi all share minus 15.48% year to date. And the NSE 20 minus 22.62% year to date. Thank you for listening.